Norfolk State versus North Carolina Central was one of the biggest games in HBCU basketball this year, and Jamari Thomas took over when the Spartans needed him. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off doesn't mean that the journey is over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On to get twenty dollars off your first purchase we wrap up today's episode with a little bit of good news and a little bit of bad news and when i say news i mean things that we need to cover not news about the show in general but the last segment will be split into two prior to that we'll look at texas southern stopping their slide and trust me they needed to avoid going 0-3 over that tough three game stretch but we kick it off with what was the biggest game of the weekend or excuse me of monday night and also one of the biggest games if not the biggest game of HBCU college basketball. This for me, Norfolk State versus North Carolina Central was a game that I needed to watch. I was so happy that they had this game on ESPNU because I didn't want to go look at a box score. I didn't want to try to catch some highlights that might be clipped up from Twitter or maybe a 15 minute video on YouTube. I wanted to watch this game basically from tip off until the end of regulation or overtime. I wanted to watch this and everybody should have felt the same way. This game did not disappoint. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to catch it right when it tipped off, but I had had to record the episode and things of that nature. But I got there, got there about 10 minutes through the first half. I'm glad, or I, I wouldn't say I'm glad, but one thing that I was able to still keep up to date with was the shooting struggles of Norfolk State in the first half because they kept documenting it. They kept documenting how much the shooting was irregular for them because they're typically a pretty good shooting team. But all of that was left in the first half. I was able to catch some of it. But once the second half started, Jamari Thomas took over. And I would actually point to a moment at the end of the first half that sparked the change. It was the last 30 seconds. It was the last actually three points that Norfolk scored in that first half of action. Thomas was at the free throw line. He made his first one. He missed the second one. He ran up and got the rebound, caught it, and basically shot immediately, but got fouled on that shot attempt. So it ended up being two different trips to the free throw line, totaling up to three points because he made his third and fourth free throws of what was really just a quick session, right? That play seemed minor. Oh, good play by Jamari Thomas. That's a good hustle play. But for me, when looking at that moment, even then, I thought it was a bigger moment than just a, a hustle play. I felt like it had the potential to be a spark for something. And it always felt like Norfolk was trying to come back, come back, come back. But then North Carolina Central would do something that kind of quieted that energy. This happened going into halftime. And I was interested to see if they could maintain that energy. And they did. And a lot of that had to do with Jamari Thomas, because when you are a star player, you have to understand that it is your job to seize the moment. It is your job to take over when the team needs you and the team needed Jamari Thomas. And he was the spark. When you look at the overall overall turnaround of Norfolk State in that first half to second half, you went from shooting five of twenty three to shooting 24 of 50 by the end of the game. That took your shooting percentage 
from 22% in the first half to 71% in the second half. This was, or 70% in the second half. This is a, not only a reflection of Thomas, but a reflection of the team's ability to stay focused, to stay settled and not lose themselves. Because it was easy to get kind of out of character, but you ramped up your defense to make sure that the game never got too far away from you. And then when you started to come back, you used your defense to make sure that you got the lead and stayed with the lead. This was really a phenomenal game, but Jamari Thomas was the heartbeat. I've given you numbers for the team themselves. Their shooting percentage going from 22% to above 70%. This was a, a team victory, yes. But I don't believe that the team gets the action that they did if it wasn't for Jamari Thomas's scoring from the beginning. He led the surge at the beginning of that second half. He went from scoring eight points in the first half all together. So I think maybe in the first five minutes, he had eight points. And he ended up with 20 points in that second half all together. Jamari Thomas stepped up and... On a day when I felt like Harris and Cleveland could have been better, Poor Boy King, he did do a good job for Central, but I felt the duo of Harris and Cleveland, they didn't step up to the occasion. Jamari Thomas, the star of Norfolk State, he did step up. He did live up to the uh, to the occasion. And whether that was getting steals that led to points, he did that twice, had three steals on the night, all in the second half. Whether that was knocking down a couple of big-time three-pointers, whether that was just getting to the free-throw line because – that moment at the end of the first half that I kind of spoke about, he saw it and then he became more aggressive after that. And he ended up getting over 10 free throw attempts in the last 20 minutes of action and going 16 of 19 from the free throw line. Over half of his points were from the free throw line. It wasn't just, oh, they're calling ticky tack fouls. It was him understanding body leverage. It was him understanding how to get that contact and get the shot up. I didn't feel like there was many, if any, cheap fouls that got called. In be on behalf, I should say, got called on behalf of Jamari Thomas. Now, when you look at Norfolk State, they are now at the top of the conference with nobody within two games of them. They're very comfortable. They're very comfortable. North Carolina Central failed, but they were able to cushion the blow because Morgan State lost. Howard lost, and now they're a part of a five-team mashup at five and four for second in the conference. This is actually ridiculous because I said it. Hey, I don't think that Howard and Morgan State are going to lose. It had nothing to do with who they were facing. I meant absolutely no disrespect to those two teams. It just never works out like that. But I guess never say never, right? Never say never. It was just – it was a very fortunate turn of events because – you're still in second place if you're North Carolina Central. There's way too many teams to be talking about tiebreakers. You had second place, and there's four other teams that are five and four. You have all of the control still. You can still go through and you can beat Morgan State because you have to face them again. Um, I think it's South Carolina. I think they also have South Carolina State one more time, if I'm not mistaken. So they they you still have chances to defeat these teams who are tied with you. Howard, you've already faced them twice. This will be a very interesting finish to that, to that, I guess, second through seventh. Yeah. Second through six, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So you're looking at those five teams. I'll be interested to see what happens there. I don't want to make it seem as if North Carolina Central is completely scot free. Like they still have to, they still have to deal with the fact that they're not going to be first place. I think that's going to go to Norfolk State. Never say never, but I don't believe that Norfolk State will lose their two-game lead to anybody with five games left. They're playing way too well, in my opinion, and I know they lost a game recently to Maryland Eastern Shore, but this is the exact reason why I told you that wasn't a big deal. They still controlled their own destiny. Now they're two games removed from Norfolk State or from North Carolina Central. They can't be... They weren't swept, so they won't lose that tiebreaker off right head to head. There's just so many more possibilities at two through six than there is number one. I think number one is going to be Norfolk State. Now, as we push forward, here goes another team that went through a, a very difficult stretch and they needed a victory on Monday night. That's Texas Southern. I don't believe that they would have lost to Southern if TSU would have lost to Southern. I don't believe we can sit here with confidence when discussing the Tigers, but you know what? 
Let's just look at this whole situation as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time, and Game Time is the number one place for all of your last-minute ticket deals. Now, say you're in Baltimore because Norfolk State is about to go to Baltimore to face Coppin State and also face Morgan State. If you're in Baltimore, how about you look up on Game Time how much these tickets are? Maybe you're in the DFW. You want to see the Mavericks. You want to see the stars. You can go there and you can also see your seat. You can see your seat before you even buy. So now you can feel comfortable with where you're going to sit, the view that you'll have. If you find a better ticket in the same row, in the same section for less, then you will get 110% back on the difference. It's that easy, but that's how confident that they are that you won't find a better price. If it's up to me, I would tell you to go to game time, look at what's going on in your local area, whether that's sporting or comedy, theater, everything in between. Go to game time, create an account if you haven't already, and use the code locked on. You'll get $20 off your first purchase. Use the code locked on, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. For your second listen, make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports today. Go there right now as I'm talking and subscribe so that you get notifications every single day. First of its kind, 24-7 Sports Network on YouTube. Now, Texas Southern stops their slide and they absolutely need it to on Monday night versus the Southern Jaguars. Now, we previewed this back-to-back games against the Louisiana schools for TSU. That was Grambling and Southern. Grambling was Saturday. Southern was Monday. We previewed those two games after TSU lost to Bethune. And I know I'm, I'm naming a lot of schools. I'm throwing them out at you. But trust me, I'm going to centralize and I'm going to bring it back. Because this isn't just a two-team conversation. This isn't just Texas Southern and the, the Texas Southern Tigers and the Southern Jaguars. This is bigger than that. Southern is sitting on their little perch at 10 and three, just saying, I'm going to stay even with, with Grambling and I'm going to beat them at the end of the year. And then we're going to be the number one seed. that this is bigger than a two team conversation. Texas Southern is the focus of this conversation, but all of the people around them, the teams in the SWAC that are going on different runs, this SWAC looks significantly different than I thought it would a week ago. A week ago, I was talking about how Texas Southern needed to split these matchups and you couldn't go on a three-game losing streak. It would just be deadly. And that statement is still true, but I don't think I knew the degree to which how monumental and how pivotal that this game was going to be against Southern. You lost to Grambling if you're TSU. You lost to Bethune-Cookman. You're on a two-game losing streak, and you understand you don't want to lose three in a row. No matter how comfortable I felt about their tournament chances to make the tournament you didn't want to get three games down and, and now you're getting close to being out but let's talk about how close they are because right now they're eight and five TSU is eight and five let's look around the swack though Alcorn four game winning streak Jackson State four game winning streak those two teams sit at eight and five with TSU and TSU still has both of them on the schedule you look at Alabama a and they're on a three-game winning streak. They're at seven and six. If Texas Southern would have lost to Southern, if TSU were to be on a three-game losing streak right now, they will be at seven and six, and they would only be one game ahead of University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, who is at six and seven, and is the first team out of the tournament. That's how important that this game against Southern was. If TSU would have lost this game, you're looking at a team that is barely in the tournament. I mean, the record good enough to be the last team in one game away from not being in the tournament. That's how close. That's how pivotal that this matchup was. So now that you win, you get a little bit of an extra cushion, get a little bit of an extra space. But overall, I, I don't love it. I would have liked to see them have defeated Grambling as well. I would have liked to see them have defeated Bethune-Cookman as well, one or the other. Of course, I want them to win every single game. We ain't hiding favoritism when it's on display. The flag is behind me. I would like for TSU to go undefeated. But if you're looking at the, the reasonable situation in this three-game stretch, two and one would have been extremely favorable. It would have been. That would have been the situation that you're looking at to be walking out of this with four losses, 
instead of five. But we can at least be thankful that you're not walking out with six losses because then we start to question if you can make the tournament. And I said this last week. TSU is a threat if they make the tournament. I don't really care where they are. And I can base that off of history, which was really just last year. They won eighth or excuse me, they were eighth in the conference and they won that tournament. But then also what's happened this year has kind of proven that I was listening to the commentary from Norfolk State versus North Carolina Central. And I don't know who the commentator was who said it, but they basically talked about how there are certain themes within this matchup between Central and Norfolk that are constant over the years, despite the fact that the players have changed. And sometimes these things are just common. Sometimes you're looking at teams who just have common threads in the one thing that is the same as the coach. And you can point to the coach and say he has them together or she has them together. And that's what I feel about TSU. First off, it was just last year that they were eighth, the eighth seed and made it to the tournament finals and won the, the, the SWAC tournament and knocked off one and two seeds on the way to get there. It was just last year. But I don't want you to think that I'm living on the backs of the last couple of years in which they haven't won the regular season championship, but they did win the tournament. I don't want you to think I'm living on the back of that. TSU just knocked off the Southern Jaguars, who is the number one seed. Well, technically, they're not the number one seed because they lost to Grambling. They would be number two right now. But TSU also knocked off Grambling. So if we're having this conversation about the threat level of TSU, this is what I mean. We had a conversation, oh, what what, um, what games or teams with a winning record have they beaten? And they've beaten Southern and, and they've beaten Grambling. The two teams who are at 10 and 3 and are two games separated from everybody else. They've knocked off the two top dogs. This is what I mean when I say TSU is always going to be a threat and you have to look at them as such as long as they make it into the tournament. You, There's no other team who can say that they've done that this year. There's no team in the SWAC who can say that they've beaten Southern and they've beaten Grambling except for TSU. These things matter. These things hold weight. I'm not just pulling things out of my backside. I'm not just pulling favoritism out TSU should be viewed as a threat not only because of what they, what they have done in history but then also what they have done in 2024 they've knocked off enough big dogs for you to feel like all right they can get anybody they just got to get in and by beating southern they're not one game away from being out that is the biggest benefit of stopping the slide nobody wants to go on a three game losing streak but with the amount of teams who are going on three game four game winning streaks in the SWAC I don't know if TSU could have afforded to go on a three-game losing streak. As you push forward, I got some good news and I got some bad news. One thing that I'm excited to cover and one thing that I, I, I'm not excited to do it, but it needs to be because UAPB is concerning me. Meanwhile, a fist women's basketball player just made a little bit of history. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Now, basketball is back. This should be back tomorrow, right? You're going into Wednesday today. Tomorrow they'll be back. You can put some money down on NBA action after the All-Star break. You can put some in, uh, some money down on the MLB, some futures, right? You can put some money down on NHL. The draft will be coming up soon if it's not already there. You have all of these things on FanDuel, and it's up to you to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Now, I've been preaching this for a while, but maybe you hadn't been listening. And you know what? I understand. I've been in the same boat. I've heard a, an ad 50 million times, but it took me 50 million and one to finally go in. If you're new to FanDuel and this is the one that makes you get started, you'll get $150 back in bonus bets if you put down a winning $5 bet. So all you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. And if you're new, to FanDuel. Go ahead and take advantage of those $150 in bonus bets you'll get with a winning $5 bet. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. We got some good news and we got some bad news. And I think that we should watch down the bad news with the good news. So we're going to start off with the negativity. And that is the fiasco that happened at UAPB on Monday night. 
Now, shout out to Mo Carter who sent me the video. He, he was also on the broadcast and he was like, this happened and they actually had to cancel the UAPB versus Alabama A&M women's basketball game just 30 seconds earlier than it was supposed to. It was 30 seconds left of regulation. But the reason they stopped action is because UAPB got into a fight with UAPB. I do believe that the Golden Lions, the Lady Lions, they're, they're a talented squad. And I've been excited to watch them versus Jackson State pretty much all year. But watching a fight like this that had to lead to the game being ended early is taking away a little bit of my excitement because this don't feel like a championship game, fighting each other on the court. I understand that fights happen in locker rooms. I understand that everybody don't get along. I understand that tempers flare and emotions get high. I'm not ignorant of any of those facts. But I also believe that if those things happen, or in order for a fight to happen and security to have to come out in the middle of a game, tempers have to be extremely high. Emotions have to be extremely flared to a point where you no longer think about this isn't a good idea. This is not the time and the place. I think it takes a lot for you to get to that point in the middle of a game with somebody who is your own teammate. That's what I think. And I could be wrong in that. But that is a large amount of my assumption is that things have to be really bad for you to, to either no longer care or forget where you are when we're talking about fighting a teammate and security coming out and them ending the game early. And it was like three, four of the players out there doing it. I've heard some whispers on what it is. I think that speaking on it is gossipy. I think that is messy. I'm going to leave it alone. But I will say that I was told that Zay Green was a part of this fight. And this is your star player. I would prefer for my star player to be the person who after the fight goes in there and talks to the team. This is not a time to, to pile on her and bash her. I don't think that this was a good moment. It is what it is. But the bigger picture is you're supposed to be one of the best teams in the conference. And you're fighting each other in the middle of a game on the court. I can only think about how bad things are off the court or how bad things are in the locker room at practice. I'm okay with people fighting each other at practice because I'm aware that it happens. I'm not trying to sit here and just say, how dare you fight your teammate? That's your teammate. No, but you can't do that in the middle of a game. Point blank period. I don't, I don't even feel like that's discussable. Discussable. I like it, but I don't think that's a word. I don't think that's up for discussion. <laughs> now let's get into the positive. And that's Fisk women's basketball player, Mayu Buchanan. Oh, my. She, this is, this is one of the craziest stat lines I've seen in a long time in HBCU basketball. She went 60 and 19. And not only did she score 60 points, she did it without making a single three-pointer. Shot 24 or 38 from the field. Extremely efficient. 12 or 16 from the free throw line. And I can actually say, that this has not happened in my lifetime. It's been since 1988 that any NAIA player has scored 60 points. It's been since 1988. I didn't say HBCU player. I didn't say I didn't say Fisk player. It's been since 1988. So you were looking at 35, 36 years since any player on the NAIA level, male or female has dropped 60 points. This is a ridiculous outcome. And then you have to look at how she got there. Like I told you, no three-point shooters or no three-point shots made. She took one, didn't make that one, and go back to it. That's not even really her game like that. The most three-pointers she's ever taken in a game was three. Not only is this a high for NAIA in the last three and a half decades, this is a, obviously, a school record, men's or women's, for Fisk. And she did it on 63% shooting. There's players in your next game that you're going to watch that are going to drop 20 points and they won't shoot 63%. That is incredibly efficient. And to not have any threes to really bolster that, to only be going by twos and ones. This is like when my friends and I are playing on, on the court. We ain't no threes, we're doing twos and ones. 
Like, like that, that's that's what we're talking about. Scoring 60 points off of two pointers and three in and, and, and free throws. You got to give a round of applause. You got to give her flowers. This was a historic performance, and this was something that you're not going to see again for a long time. Let me repeat this one more time. I don't care if you're talking about a man or a woman. I'm talking about women's basketball, men's basketball. There has not been a single NAIA player in the last 35 years, 1988, 35 to 36, depending on when that date was, that has dropped 60 points. Maya Buchanan just did that. Let's give the Fisk power forward her flowers and acknowledge the fact that she just did something that we likely will not see happen for a very long time. And she did it with incredible and absolutely ridiculous efficiency. Now, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. We typically will not split the second segment into two parts, but I have a big guest coming on on Friday. I'm very excited. I'm actually about to record that episode right now. So we'll have that for you first thing Friday morning. And then we have some some HBCU Legacy Bowl conversations to have on Thursday. So I knew we probably wouldn't have time to get to both of these things. And then I wanted to make sure that we highlighted them. And they both were things that I felt like could package together to fill out a segment. So I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. Going on this ride with me segments one through three all the way to here. Thank you sincerely. In the meantime, in between time, to next time we hear each other family. Take care. Stay blessed. Peace.